Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm James Harding, uh, editor and one of the founders of Tortoise. Um, we're really delighted this evening that James Cowan from the Halo Trust and uh, Ruth Davidson, uh, the uh, MSP and um, uh, fellow fighter for good causes alongside James at Halo have joined us to have a conversation which in the last few weeks, given how much we've had our heads down and focused on our own lives, we probably haven't had enough time to think about. And that's really, what's the UK's role in the world? This is not going to be a pandemic that's gonna be solved within our shores alone. And so how can the UK be part of, even potentially lead a global answer to this when frankly there seems to have been very little global leadership. If you're new to Tortoise, if you haven't been to a Think In before, you'll know that uh it's really simple to weigh in this is an exercise in organized listening it's not just to hear from ruth and james it's actually to hear from everyone that's participating there's a really simple way of doing that as you'll see there's on the bottom of the screen there's a thing that says participants if you click on it you'll see the whole list of names comes up and there's a little gray box that says raise hand right and if you raise your hand i'm just going to have a go now yes there is my little blue hand a digital blue hand that was put up and says look i would like to say something um i'm now going to lower it but also you may just say look i'd like to participate through the uh chat so you may just write in and uh the quite brilliant chris cook who forgive me i'm just going to make a little plug here has done some phenomenal work on the economic impact of the pandemic, uh, the corona tracker that he's developed with Ella Hollywood and, and Chris Newell. But Chris Cook is here and he is going to be uh, not moderating, but possibly just weighing in from the sideline with the chat and responding to the things that you have to say. So please do. I'm just, before I come to James and Ruth, I'm actually just going to test whether any of you were even remotely listening because I'm going to uh, ask a question and see how many people agree with this statement. The world is lacking a global organization that can lead the response to the pandemic, i.e. the United Nations, the WHO, the G20 are failing to act and we are lacking a global organization that can deal with the pandemic. If you agree with that view, could you go to the participants tab find a little thing that says raise hand and say that you agree and I just want to see in the next 20 seconds how many people stick their hands up good grief almost oh my goodness I'm just scrolling through well not everyone but a very very good half all right well in that I suppose that justifies the reason why we are having this conversation and what we want to do, and just to underline the point, a thinking, if you've not been to one before, is attempt to sort of recreate uh, something that's like a long time in your past, Ruth, which is a news meeting, right? It's a gathering of people who all tell you what they think. So you know the rule, there's the one rule of a news meeting is no one asks a question, everyone tells you what they think. And we want everyone to be able to do that in the course of this next hour. So please weigh in, tell us what you, uh, tell us what you think. Um, I'm going to start, James Cowan, if I might, with you. Um, you know, you have one of those kind of dizzying life stories where you've done, you know, four or five different lifetimes, whether it's been in military or sport or obviously now with Halo. Do you think that the judgment that many people have, and I suppose I probably share it, that there doesn't seem to be a great convening, organizing, inspiring power at the helm when we are dealing with a global crisis. Oh, thanks for mentioning sport, James. Always last to be picked for the team. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's really nice to be here today. And I think what's so interesting, I'm sitting here in my office in the UK. Um, I came here today just because I was paranoid about the internet connection. Um, but essentially, whilst we've been dealing with this domestic crisis, um, I've been managing the Halo Trust, we're in 25 countries and we have 9,000 staff. So my focus, unlike I sense most of us, has been not here in the UK, but abroad. And it does give me an overview of what's taking place. And my great concern is that what we're witnessing is very naturally a focus on the domestic, but actually 
the problem is out there in the broader world. The strategies of the West, the lockdowns of the West, are strategies of wealth. Uh, for people like me who have jobs where you can sit at home and talk on Zoom. But for people who actually need to earn a living and get out there, it's very much harder. And many of the countries we work in are some of the toughest in the world. Yemen, Somaliland, Libya, Afghanistan, uh, Syria. These places have already suffered years of most terrible conflict. They're also suffering um, from drought uh, and in places like Somaliland um, from locusts. So to have now a disease over the top of that and the ensuing poverty is a real issue. And the question that arises then is how does the world um, rise to that challenge? And my concern at the moment is that our domestic preoccupations would inhibit that very significantly. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, it, it does. And, and, and I'd, like to, I'd like to hear in a moment, James, if I can, a little more in detail, because we, we had a thinking last night with Tony Blair. He'd been talking to someone at the World Food Programme who was saying, look, what's really difficult about particularly countries in Africa is that most of them don't necessarily have the apparatus to deliver the kind of lockdown you're seeing in the UK. But even if they did, there would be a bigger risk of famine and death from hunger than just death from the disease alone. So it would be really interesting to get a sense of how you think about that. Um, before, before we come, if you like, to some of the detail on that, I, I'd like to, um, to ask you, Ruth, you know, uh, you, know you, you were kind enough to write a piece for us sort of asking the question of government, the UK government, in effect, where is it on this uh, question of global leadership and the coordination of global support? C can I just sort of ask you a sort of slightly pointed question to begin with, which is, you know, the truth is, if you'd been in, a, in the Conservative cabinet right now, wouldn't all of your energy be on delivering for the UK? And actually, there's not realistically the bandwidth to be doing something internationally within government right now. Well, that's actually one of the things that I wrote in the piece that's on your site is that it's quite understandable that the current UK government cabinet, the head of all of the NHS trust, everybody that's on the, the field is um, engaged in the UK end of this. And, and I know that politicians uh, have been getting into trouble for using military analogies um, over the last few weeks, but I, I'm, I'm going to, with permission, do that here. And, and it's, not a, it's not a comparison, it is an analogy. Um, there is this an, an enormous battle that's happening in hospitals and care homes and in the lockdown and, and in policy making and, and in procurement for PPE and all of these things that are happening and everybody's involved in, in that battle. And But what we're asking people to do now is to, to find some branch of government which can horizon scan because we can get the UK out of this part of the battle. We can get them off the battlefield with as few casualties as possible, but that's not enough to stop the war because COVID didn't come from the UK and it's not going to be finished in the UK. To eradicate a disease, you have to eradicate it, or a pandemic, you've got to eradicate it everywhere. And that's where I think organisations um, like the Halo Trust, like WaterAid, Mercy Corps, Save the Children, Islamic Relief, Oxfam, all of these brilliant UK NGOs that are already working in the hardest to reach places with some of the least trustful uh, and hardest to reach people have the opportunity, if properly supported now, to, to lay the foundations for what's going to need to happen anyway. So let's let's not use this time, let's use this time, let's not waste this time while we're waiting for a vaccine, which is probably the only way we, we win the war. Um, it, you know, let, let's use this time. And, and you know, James is an ex-military man himself and, and no time spent on preparation is, is, is time wasted. But, but you're absolutely right. If I was in cabinet right now, I would be consumed by how do I get PPE to the front line? How do I make sure that we're, we're joining all the right dots on where we see spikes, whether that's BME, uh, BAME people who seem to be having a worse reaction to this or yeah. uh, medics who've got a viral load or, you know, I would be consumed by that. Of course I would. But that's why you need people that are on the outside to start doing that horizon scan now. And what we're saying is, yes, the UK government has, has committed a lot of cash to this, but it also needs to, to take this opportunity to task people with what's going to need to happen anyway, but to get in front of it now. And I'm, I'm going to come, I can see some people have got their hands up already, uh, Mehdi Ascaria, Amanda Pullinger, Robert Fox, I'm going to come to each of them in a second. But, but can I just understand one thing you're saying, Ruth? When you're talking about horizon scanning, are you saying, look, we've got within the Foreign Office or we've got within the MOD 
people around the world, within DFID obviously, people around the world who are on the ground and who can see what's happening? Or are you saying, look, we need to centralise that and have, if you like, a task force that's doing exactly that? Well, well, let me let me put it in numbers for you. So um, before I came onto this thinking, I, I, I spoke to the government to get the latest kind of figures on what it is that they've committed to the international effort against COVID. And mm. it's £744 million, pounds, which is significant, really significant. But if you break that down, that's 150 to the IMF, it's 75 to the WHO, it's 250 to KEPI or SEPI or whichever way you say it, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and in Innovations, which is the, the guys that make the vaccines. Uh, they've given 200 million to international charities, of which 130 million goes to the UN, 50 million to the Red Cross, and 20 million goes to the individual NGOs that we have in the UK. So of 744 million pounds, 20 million is going to NGOs. That's you know, less than 3%. And these are the guys who I think, as with my halo hat on, uh, and who are telling me that they are willing and able to pivot what they do. Um, you know, halo digs mines out of the ground, but it's got ambulances, it's got mapping, it's got people on the ground, it's got fleets of uh, Land Rovers, it's got, it's got buy-in from some of the warlords that don't let Westerners into places. Uh, and it's got people who have been locally recruited and are experts and can work to discipline to do that. The same with WaterAid. They, you know, build wells, but they are able to pivot and they have resources that they can do. Islamic Relief has buy-in in countries where somebody with a big UK government flag won't possibly get the same access and the same response. So let's be looking to what we can harness now. And it's, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan herself doing all of this work mm. it's about recognizing the resource that we have and empowering that resource to start feeding into what we know we're going to need to do we're not going to get a vaccine this side of christmas probably mm. um you know so we've got months and years of planning to, to sorry months of, of this uh, till next year to plan this but we are still going to need to vaccinate in countries outside of the uk okay so so all right so i begin to understand what we're talking about what we're really talking about here is not the sort of quantum of government spending. It's not £744 million. It's the fact that so much of that is being channeled, if you like, from government to other intergovernmental institutions, and that the people on the ground who can react, if you like, most quickly to a very fast-moving virus are getting a tiny fraction. If you say, you know, £20 million, which, which, don't get me wrong, that is not a criticism. You know, £20 million pounds to these organisations absolutely will help them to plan and, and help them to start making that pivot. But mm. I think what we do need to recognise is that we punch above our weight in this field in, mm. in the UK. We have some of the best policy, policy sort of brains uh, that can help coordinate this. And we also have some of the, the real kind of gold standard organisations that happen to be headquartered here, but that mm. operate everywhere. Um, and I think that, you know, they want to help. They're ready and waiting. They have logistics, they have people, they have resource, but they need to be, they need to be empowered to do it. And, and to be honest, this is probably, um, having said all of that, this is probably where I have to hand over to James to talk about, you know, some of the boots on the ground stuff, because, you know, he very kindly has, has taken me to places where bad people shoot other bad people and that you dig mines out of the ground and that's very nice. But, I, you know, I, I don't have that touch and feel that somebody who lives this every day would have. All right, Ruth, I'm going to come, and James, I'm going to come to you in a second on that, but actually there are a few people who've got their hands up and I'd like to bring them in and, and, uh, and hear their thoughts. Amanda Pulger, um, I think you're there with us. Can I come to you? Hello. Can we hear you one moment? I'm yes. here. Yes. We can hear you. Yes. Hello. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean actually, I, I, I was actually going to ask the question that, that Ruth has just kind of asked, which is for James to give us some very specific examples of how Halo is able, is able to pivot. I mean, I, I really do think that Halo is an organization um, that is uniquely positioned in this perspective for all the reasons that Ruth said. Um, and I think it would be helpful for people to understand some of the specifics ar around how Halo can take exactly what they're doing today and shift the mission to being COVID-19 focused. So that was really going to be my question. Uh, okay, Amanda, thank, thanks very much. And I, um, I'm going to take that on to James in, in a second, but I'm going to hear just some, some of the other um, hands who are up. Um, Medi Ascari has got his uh, hand up. Um, 
Med, are you there? Yes. Hello. What's on your mind? Oh, one second. There's just a slight delay for some reason on the um, audio. So are you unmuted? Let's see. This is one of these great, it's like being invited to one of my family events. You can come, but you can't speak. Um, there you are. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, just want to pick up something from the back end of uh, Tony Blair's uh, talk yesterday. And I'd love to address that very briefly to Ruth that whether we've actually got the right model of leadership. Do we really need a crisis leadership now? And from what I can see, what can be observed, we've got a command and control leadership now. We need something innovative. We need something somehow different, something more integrated, if you like, rather than the simple command and control. Uh, do you share this view? Yeah. Okay, that's that, Mehdi, that's really that's really interesting. I'm going to put that to Ruth in a second too, but I'm also going to bring in just finally Ruth Fo uh, Robert Fox, who I think is here with us too, and just hear what Robert had to say. Hello, Robert. Hello. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted, and you're wearing a really cool T-shirt. Uh, yeah, but it's um, it's it's blagged from North Vietnam by my son. Um, <laughs> so, um, I want to go to the, your top question, and it's about all these institutions doing the horizon scanning. I mean, these are all best intentioned, but I almost groan when I hear there's a think tank in the Foreign Office and in DFID and in the Home Office and in Customs and Excise, because the, the problem that we're seeing and acutely we're experiencing it domestically is how siloed our thinking is. Yeah. Um, it, and there's something wrong, and I think as the previous spec, uh, 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 speaker, was it Matthew? I think he was right in implying that there's something wrong with the toolbox or we're missing a particular set of tools or, or clubs in the golf bag, use whatever analogy that you want to really grasp the crisis where it is. Because counterintuitively, I would say that we really need people thinking not just COVID-19 at the moment beyond it, because it is the uh, combination of crises that are building up. I mean, we're talking mm. about the new buzzword, of course, in UK is resilience, resilience, resilience. And I don't think people know what, I, what, what they mean by it half the time. For mm. me, resilience is having enough strength in the social infrastructure to be able to deal with a perfect storm, a number of phenomena together. And, uh, but uh, again, I would argue against myself that mm. you need somewhere some group of people completely hidden that can really address the problem in the way that they did in, 19, in 1943 in San Francisco, the way that they, in the, that strange Churchill Attlee coalition government, they had people planning for what's going to come uh, right. afterwards. I'm sorry, Ruth, the trouble is with the wretched conservative government that I see that they should be planning for a thing called Brexit all the time, as much <laughs> as they're looking at, 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 at COVID-19. But for the educationalists, I think that, you know, that people like myself, like James, indeed, uh, I, 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 he's a co-conspirator. We grew up uh, with a wonderful uh, set of educational tools built on reading history at Oxford University. Why, amongst my trade of journalists, is there so little em emphasis on human geography and mm. the effects of human geography? So what I'm saying is that actually we want to cultivate organizations and i agree i think it is going to come from the ngo world to think outside the box mm. not deny the box because the box is terribly important but how we're going to move into different streams of thought because what is coming is, is really a tipping point because mm -hmm. i've witnessed it through my working life a planet of seven eight billion is very different from one of three or four robert thank you thanks so much i'm going to put so a combination of those things um, to James, um, but I also am really struck by some of the points that are coming up in the chat. David Chemist Betty has just made this really good point about actually horizon scanning beyond just COVID-19, thinking about, you know, the second wave of problems. So I'm going to come to some of you if it's possible. Um, but James, can I come to you first and just say, can you pick up on a couple of those things? Amanda's point about you know, and, and forgive me, I don't know enough about Halo and what it's exactly doing on the ground. So when Amanda says, how do you pivot from doing the things we know you for, you know, mine clearance, etc., to doing what seems like a totally different set of jobs around 
you know, containment and shielding around uh, COVID. How would you feasibly do that? And would you also just pick up on the idea that Robert touched on just then about whether or not there's a role for NGOs to try and come together to do the horizon scanning that Ruth was mentioning? Yeah, I'd love to do that. And I think to the first point, I'd like to make a slightly surprising point, perhaps, which is I don't want to plug the Halo Trust. My view is that there are a whole range of British NGOs that are there and able to do an amazing job for this country on behalf of the globe. And we should be drawing on them all. So it's not simply me to say something about my organization, the Halo Trust. But to your particular point, I think the reason why a mine action charity, why would a mine action charity have something to offer in this? Well, it's this, that we have a lot of people. Uh, we're the biggest employer in Somaliland. Um, we have lots of vehicles, we have lots of ambulances. Um, you can clear, spend a lot of money clearing landmines from a place that has no landmines. So we've perfected the art of survey. Now, it's not very difficult, therefore, to pivot that survey about landmines onto uh, the, the track and trace aspect of this disease. Um, and in much the same way that the army is doing in this country. We're also, uh, we have an extensive logistic infrastructure. So in countries like Afghanistan, we're being asked to lead the logistic cluster there. And so we begin to act as a lead, in a leadership role, helping governments along with their planning, because we can also do that sophisticated planning. So I'd like to take this to the other part of the question, which is how you integrate these things. Now, there is a thing that was happening until COVID called the integrated review happening within Whitehall. I think what's so fascinating, it was being headed up by Professor John Bew, uh, who's written a, a really wonderful um, biography of Attlee, who of course played that number two role in the wartime coalition. So I think that the history uh, cycle is coming round and he knows what needs to be done. But my view is it needs to get beyond simply NGOs working together, the clues in the title of the integrated review. It's about integrating all arms of government and outside in the non-governmental space to make this happen. And I do think there has been tribalism. I do think Robert is right. There's too much siloing and a reluctance on the part of many NGOs uh, to work with the military. I think that needs to be overcome. And I think often a, a reluctance on the part of the military to work with NGOs. Now that is a sort of uh, or, or almost a heresy in certain quarters. But I think it needs to be confronted head on. And I think the world that uh, sat cosily for so many decades now needs to be addressed in this current crisis. And, and James, can you just, can you just um, give us a little more detail about how you move from tracking and tracing landmines to tracking and tracing a virus. You know, Lucia Halpern, who's on the, in the chat, said, look, can you really give us a case study in that? Yeah, like, so... Point. Yeah. How, how would that actually work? So, I mean, a really great example is uh, the, the wars that have been happening recently have not, on the main, I'm, 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 I'm generalising massively, but they've been urban conflicts, uh, not rural ones. So we've been perfecting the art of, of, uh, of survey in urban environments. So let's take CERT, a city in Libya, it's been horrifically affected by uh, Al-Qaeda, the last Al-Qaeda stronghold in, in Libya, uh, and it has had uh, the, the decade of violence that we all know about um, since uh, the fall of Gaddafi. Now, we have been dealing with the uh, explosive contamination in that city, uh, and it's very easy, as I say, to spend a lot of money clearing uh, landmines from areas that don't have it. And what we have been doing is working with um, pro bono supporters, mostly with uh, West Coast um, software providers to perfect our GIS. We're very good at collecting in data, um, conducting uh, on the ground uh, recce to discover where um, the problem is. And this brings us into contact with communities because it's largely through talking to people that you establish how these things work. We're bringing in um, apps to conduct that work. And we know that in this country, a lot of the scientific work is now on um, bringing in of apps for contact tracing. So these are the sort of techniques that ought to be used by government. And you can take a, a, a charity like our own that's had a singular purpose in the form of landmines and then pivot over to this new problem. And what government uh, needs... And James, sorry to interrupt you, but how quickly could you do that? So it's Thursday... We're already doing it. Right. We're already doing it. So let's take Cambodia. You know, one of the key pillars of mine action is mine risk education. So we've pivoted out of mine risk education into COVID education. Uh, we've reached nearly 300,000 beneficiaries in Cambodia in a postering campaign, getting out there to remote communities that don't have internet access and putting up COVID-related posters, talking to people about how they should do it. 
In yeah. Somaliland, there's a really interesting example. Uh, Somaliland is an entrepot. The port of Berbera um, feeds goods into Ethiopia and allows goods to be exported from Ethiopia. It is also in the form of goats, a major food supply into Saudi Arabia, and yet that's closed off. So what we're seeing is a very significant economic effect on a country like Somaliland. And the reason is that the border crossing points are closed. There are no hand washing stations. There are no quarantine sites. And we can build these things and then unlock the trade and get things back to normal. Okay, James, thank, thank you very much. I mean, it's interesting, uh, Sarah and Jerry in the, in the chat stream next to, as you're speaking, they said landmine clearance organizations have outreach programs in communities where they perform risk education. They are sometimes the only contact with the outside world that this communities, these communities have. They're therefore very well placed in reaching such communities. Uh, just a sort of interesting point. So I hope that gives a sense of how that pivot works. Ruth, can I come back to you on the point that Mehdi made at the beginning? And, uh, and I noticed that it's a point that actually Rob Buck picks up because I suppose the question that I asked right at the start sort of cuts both ways. Either we do want some kind of big global institutions to step in and coordinate and lead these changes, or we think, look, it's going to be smaller organizations working close to these communities on the ground they're going to be much more effective at making this change what or, or sort of help address this uh, crisis what do you think is it a big institutional push or is it moving money through ngos that have close working relationships with communities on the ground well, well i think what I, I took from from both speakers there was a frustration with things as they are and a wish to move to a different type of leadership. Um, Robert Bock said, we'll get rid of command and control, we'll, we'll do something much bigger. And, and uh, you know, Mehdi had said that, you know, taking on from, from what Tony Blair had said, um, you know, there's a, a way in which government wasn't set up to deal with a problem like this because it didn't foresee a problem like this. It was dealing with the, you know, the machinations that happen every day. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's almost impossible to change the way in which uh, you organise leadership within a nation state um, mm. in the middle of something like this. However, what I would say is this is something which crosses all nation states. It has no respect for boundaries, borders, visas, uh, language, anything like that. And what we've seen around the world has been quite a nationalistic response in that it has been about closing borders, making sure that there's supply lines for the country that you serve, etc. And, and one of the things that we're suggesting is that if you don't want to be dealing with a second wave, a tertiary wave, you know, etc., which you we have seen from other pandemics, it's likely that you will, is that you have to have a, a, a a program that works all around the world. So you have to get out of that kind of, uh, of nation state silo. So, I, I mean, to slightly dodge the question, you know, the way in which government is set up is the way in which government is set up. And there is there will be no bandwidth to change the, the machine of government while the government is dealing, dealing with this. But what governments have is they have a convening power. And that's, I think, what the, the big push is going to have to be is let's use that convening power of government and let's use the resource of government to empower people at a, at a sub nation state level to go out and do some of the operational stuff that's incredibly hard to do and, and that that's what takes you on to what James has been talking about and, and the way in which Halo can work and, and all of these other organizations can work and and let's you know let's use the resources we have to address this this big overwhelming um event that you know, even if you're a student of human geography and if you're a student of history and even if you went to Oxford to, to study it, um, you know, you haven't seen since the Spanish flu of 1918. Yeah. And, and, and Ruth, can you talk a little bit about the, the politics of this and what happens mm -hmm. now to politics? Because uh, I think that we had a rather ambitious title for this at one stage, which was Britain International, How the UK Can Lead the Global Response to This Pandemic. And... There was a yeah, and, and you subbed it down mercilessly. I did. I subbed, I, subbed it down, <laughs> I subbed it down partly because I thought there's a risk that we're a laughing stock here. That there is, yeah. there is well, no well, such. That, that's well, just well, not happening. interesting because I, I, um, I, yeah, I, I put out on my social media channels a, a link to the the piece that that um, James and I co-authored for for the site, um, mm. saying you know you, you know there is a, a, a way in which Britain can have a leadership role here and, and had lots of, of, of my usual Scots nationalist fans uh, <laughs> calling me like all of the, you know, all of the names under the sun without having read the piece, which is about, 
not the nation state of Britain particularly necessarily leading, but about all of the resource that we have in terms of these individual organisations taking on a lot of the work, but making sure that the convening power that Britain has of bringing people together and empowering you know, their resource can do that same thing. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, this is not about you know, pretending that half the globe is, is coloured pink uh, and that, you know, we want to bestride it and, and tell people what to do. But it is recognising that the things that we're doing now to try and protect our population and to stop spread and to, uh, you know, get the, the R number below, um, below one uh, is isolation. It is, um, you know, social distancing. It's all of these things when 30% of the world's urban population lives in slums. You can only self-isolate if you have running water, sanitation and food and the ability to stay alive at the point in which you're self-isolated. Now, there are vast swathes of the earth that don't have that. Mm. So they can't do any self-isolation. So they will continue to spread um, within their own communities. Uh, and the only way that we stop you know, breakouts happening uh, is by making sure that when we deal with this, we deal with this everywhere. So, so um, can I put that, by the way, if you're, if you've joined, um, I see the numbers of people who join us have sort of crept up. If you've joined um, in the last little while and you don't know how to weigh in, do just weigh in on the chat or if you hit the participants tab, you'll see you can raise your hands. Please do. We want to hear from as many people as possible in the course of the time that we have. But, but can I just take that point uh, and put it back to you, James, because part of the problem, I think, that lots of people have, certainly that I feel, is I can't actually work out what the best thing that the international aid and development community can do when there is not the government infrastructure to impose the kind of responses that are being uh, imposed in much of the West, i.e. we've seen the sort of, you know, really um, uh, uneven response that there's been in a country such as India and the consequences of that. And we're hearing, just beginning to hear, of the infrastructure problems that African governments are going to have in trying to respond to COVID-19. So, as Ruth says, if you've got 30% of population living in slums and they don't have literally the physical infrastructure to be able to self-isolate, then the idea of a lockdown, the idea of containment, the idea of shielding is just not viable in those countries. So, given the Halo Trust spread, and the work you do with other NGOs, in conjunction with other NGOs, James, what are you actually saying the UK role should be? What should it be providing? So, Joe, I think you, you really put your finger on it. And I think we've got to think in two time frames. We've got to think about the time frame in the run up to a vaccine, and, and let's hope there can be one. Of course, we don't know there can be one, but let's say there is. So, there's a period of, let's say, a year, 18 months until there is a vaccine. And I, I think you're right. I think. It is unreasonable to expect uh, very, very challenged countries to impose and sustain a lockdown. And my uh, informants tell me that a country like Angola, which is suffering the, the double effect of a, a reduced oil price as well as COVID, is not going to be able to sustain its lockdown for many more weeks. And so it will lift it because its people need to work and there is no social security uh, safety net for them. So therefore, the disease will become endemic in the period uh, until a vaccine is available. I think. And therefore, we must think of this disease not simply in terms of the direct casualties of the disease. And remember that, in, uh, sadly, of course, the disease in the West affects, uh, it tends to affect older people and people with underlying health conditions. Of course, in, in the developing world, there's a much younger demography, albeit with many underlying health conditions, notably HIV. But let's assume the disease does become endemic. Therefore, it is the other effects of the indirect effects of the disease that we need to think about. The impoverishment, the reduced oil price for Angola is a good example. Mm. And therefore, famine, drought, climate change, war, these are the effects, the destabilizing effects of this disease that are very, very real. And um, policymakers in the West need to think about very hard. And so, organizations like Halo, we are not professional medics, we're not pretending to be, but we are able to, and we always have been able to work in conflict affected countries. And we can work across both sides of a conflict, notably in Afghanistan, where we have excellent relationships both with the government and with the Taliban. So we're there to assist in that broader sense. And I think it's wrong uh, simply to focus on the disease itself. In the aftermath of a vaccine, then I think uh, we begin to think in terms of how 
the disease was brought about, the, the Ebola disease was brought about in West Africa and all the techniques that were brought to bear, but on a vastly greater scale. I hope that answers the question. It, it, it does. I, I suppose that there are two things. One is I just want to understand what you're saying, James. W when you say that prior to a vaccine, you're probably looking at a situation where in many countries in Africa this will become endemic, i.e. that it's not possible to prevent, to, to, to run an isolation program, run a lockdown in the way which we're seeing in Western countries, i.e. there are going to be a very significant wave of, of deaths as a result of COVID-19 in some of those countries. That's correct. I think that's right. A lockdown is a strategy of, of, of well-off people. Right, of, of well-off and suppression. Okay. And, and then there's, 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 there's a point here, and just also the second thing, just so I understand, when you're saying decline, you know, collapse the oil price, impoverishment of countries like Angola, and you're also talking about famine and hunger, what you're saying is we are in a position to and need to prepare for a series of different humanitarian uh, disasters, sorry for the cliche, rather than just worry about COVID-19. Yes, there's a hugely destabilizing effect, uh, and that effect will be felt politically. I think democracies in, in fragile countries will be very affected by this. Uh, and economically, we're already seeing tens of, I mean, I understand the African Union has estimated 20 million people made redundant already in Africa. So things like fragile economies, such as the fresh produce industry in, in Kenya, or the apparel industry in Ethiopia, are very, very affected by what's taking place. So it's these broader outcomes that we need to focus on. There, there, there's, a, there's a point here made by uh, Richard Shiroth, um, and I'm just, I don't know whether Richard, you can join it. You'll probably make the point um, much better than me, but the argument that he's made in the stream of chat is to say, look, this is not a time we're gonna be able to reinvent the institutions of international government. You've got to make the ones that you've got work. Like, there he is, he's got, his master of the system's got his hand up. Actually, I wanna ask you to make the point. Richard, you were going to make the point about potentially NATO. I think we've got yeah, some experience um, of that. Uh, I, I, picking up James's point about integration domestically, um, I just wanted to, to reinforce that and say that integration is absolutely essential globally. It's essential globally if the, uh, as James has just said so eloquently, if the if the disease is to be is to be is to be contained in any way and then ultimately uh, vanquished, it's got to be done internationally. But equally essential is the whole issue of the addressing the potential instability following on from the disease, as, as again, as James has just said. Um, it would be nice to build a perfect international organization to deal with it, but that's not the, now is not the time. We've got to make, we've got to make bricks with the, you know, with the clay available. Uh, and we've got the, you know, it, we've got imper imperfect international organizations like the United Nations, yes, and indeed the EU and NATO, but they can be made better. Um, in order to make them better, this needs real political energy and drive to make them better because they are effectively no more than the sum of the parts. And if individual nations want them to be more effective, uh, individual nations can make them more effective. NATO is an interesting one. Um, because it's got a command structure, it's well used to partnerships. On the face of it, of course, it's a military alliance, but actually it's got the ability to adapt to meet the needs of the moment. Again, if the nations around that North Atlantic Council table wanted, in, wanted them to be so. so. So I think we have to use the international organizations at our disposal. We have to make them better. And to return to the question uh, you posed, James, at the beginning of this, should Britain be involved? Absolutely, Britain should be involved. And it should, it should look to, to raise, its, raise its eyes above the immediate horizon and to do so. R Richard, can I just ask you to tell us a little more about how you think NATO can be involved. I, th I think I'm right in thinking that you were the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, and so you know a little bit about NATO and how its powers can be invoked, how it can then um, intervene at a time like this. Can you just tell us a little more about when you say, right, we could actually make NATO more effective, what are you, what are you specifically meaning on that? Well, NATO would, would clearly need to be, to be asked to get involved. Um, and, and as a precedent for this, uh, it may not be a particularly comfortable precedent, but the United Nations asked NATO to get involved uh, in, in establishing a, the, the no-fly zone over Libya. But if with the right, the right will behind the United Nations and the right political engagement, NATO 
uh, NATO could be involved. It, NATO and, and NATO has got the planning, the the uh, the, the decision making machinery, the planning muscle, uh, and the capability to unite nations behind a common cause. It would be a different cause, clearly, for to that which NATO was set up to do. Um, but if you're looking to build capacity um, in fragile or failing states, actually NATO is not badly suited to do that. It's done it in a number of areas, particularly in the military area, of course, in places like Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. But it's also well suited to bringing in a wide range of partners as well. And we have to work in concert with those partners, of course, but it's got that ability to do so. But it would need a fundamental mind shift to do that. And, and it would and it would need a it would need a mandate from from whom from from the UN. It, I think it would need a mandate. It would need a mandate from the United Nations to say, listen, can you take on? Uh, can NATO do something here to take on uh, support for an international effort to to address the the, the, the challenges we've been discussing? Right. James, um, can you bring us to light with a little example? I mean, the yes. most, perhaps the most challenged country in the world, I think we all know this, is Yemen. And I, I have a, a small program there. It's currently in lockdown because my staff cannot be assured of Eremedivac in the event of them being um, wounded or becoming ill. So that means that they can only operate from within the confines of uh, their particular office. Now, the reason for that is because the airport is not open and uh, flights cannot be guaranteed. Now, you can see immediately how uh, if, if the international community chose to work in an integrated way, that could easily be resolved. It's the key uh, to the door of getting on with dealing with this appalling crisis in Yemen. And it doesn't happen enough. There isn't enough integrated planning to unlock these problems and to address things that range far beyond COVID, but are now being very much accentuated by the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, and just, just to follow up on the point of, from Richard, thank you, uh, Richard, by the way, I should have said, but the, 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 the case of Yemen, or for that matter, Angola or Somaliland, presumably there is a real uh, need for the support, the infrastructure support, so that the logistics work can be done, so that that kind of uh, health, health support for workers on the ground can be available. So there is a real argument for the mandate that Richard was talking about for NATO to provide that kind of infrastructure so that there can be the delivery of, uh, you know, care and support in those countries. So, so do, you, do, you, do you agree with the idea of actually bringing NATO in on something like this? Are you asking Richard or me? I'll ask you, James, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I believe that it is a heresy for... Uh, the, the director of a, a non-governmental organization to talk about wanting military support. I believe that heresy has had its day and it's time to integrate capabilities for the broader good. And the, the, the enemy in this, and I know many people don't like the military analogy, but the enemy in this is a disease. Yeah. It's not, it's not a, a political body or anything else. So I think surely we can unite in providing that integrated response. And indeed there are good precedents and the Ebola crisis is a good example of of military and uh, humanitarian organisations working well together. Well, James, I'm going to come to a few other people who've got their hands up. Don Tyler's got uh, his hand up. I think, I hope I can come to you, Dom. I saw that you were commenting. Yes, far away. Hi. Um, so I think we've been talking recently um, a little bit about <clears throat> NATO uh, stepping into a larger role. And I think as a military, primarily military focused uh, institution, I would assume that would mostly be built around uh, militaries within NATO taking on a larger role and I think militaries worldwide do take on large disaster relief um, uh, roles but with the USS is it Theodore Roosevelt and uh, I believe a, a French aircraft carrier as well succumbing effectively to COVID-19 are militaries best placed to um, respond to this with obviously barrack conditions soldiers in, in close confines are they best placed to be able to actually uh, step into these uh, these areas which need assistance given that they are likely to be quite susceptible to COVID-19 themselves that's interesting Ruth can I come back to you on, on that um, there's a whole slew of things there that 
seems to me to need, if you like, political answers. Um, I know that you've worn a uniform too. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to um, compete with a former Major General and a former uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of NATO of what NATO's capabilities are. Um, but one thing they both touched on that I do want to raise is the what happens next argument, because yes, we're all talking about how we deal with this disease around the world, but this disease will not come by itself. And if I can give you just a few numbers, so we can kind of quantify this. Yes, we know that testing around the world isn't brilliant, but as it stands today, there have been just over 2.5 million confirmed cases around the world of people that have the disease. That's not deaths, that's just cases that have been absolutely confirmed. Um, in the last week, we've had the World Food Programme telling us that a quarter of a billion people, a quarter of a billion people, will suffer acute hunger by the end of this year, in part because of the fallout from this. We've had the UN Food Relief Programme telling us that we're heading for a famine of biblical proportion. And we've had the International Food Policy Research Institute tell us that between 14 and 22 million people will be driven into poverty. Now, this isn't about a Dutch auction of misery here. This is about making sure that we don't just deal with what's right in front of us, but that we do start having uh, you know, a reserve that's, that's looking to what happens next, because what happens after this wave of COVID is easily as terrifying as the bit we're currently in. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask you one thing? Uh, Robert Fox um, suggested or asked the question really in the chat here, is there a way that we can take the volunteer spirit that's clearly, you know, really inspired us all here in the UK and address it internationally? Is there a way that you can take some of the culture, there was another comment, the culture that exists in the NGOs, that, that kind of determination to do something about the state of the world and apply that to what's happening at a government level? What, what do you think on that, Ruth? Uh, yes, I think you can. Um, and I think that, um, I think in times of great crisis, people want to be led. They want clear leadership. They want a direction of travel and they want to be told and be leveled with about what that means and also what they can do to help. We've seen um, in this country, we've seen a, a thousand, you know, 10,000 examples of people that have done their bit, whether that's in their community, whether it's signing up to joining the NHS volunteers, whether that's donating money, whether it's any of these things. So, so that sense of we're facing these overwhelming odds, but there's something that we can do to help. Yeah. It is not a British thing, that's a human thing. So, so we can absolutely take that, but it, it, but it does require strategic leadership. Um, so it does require the convening powers of, of organisations that are already seen in leadership roles. And whether that is governments, whether that is um, the UN or the WHO or NATO or whoever, you know, people need to be shown, they need to be led, they need to be told where those energies can be best put. Okay, um, I'm going to pick up a, a few points. Um, Dominic Mouvet has got his hand up and so has Barney White Spunner. Dominic, can I come to you first, um, if that's possible? Yes. What are you thinking? Hi, James. Hi uh, thank you. No, I mean, great in, in, and interesting conversations. I, I, I run businesses in Kenya and Ethiopia. And I have to say, the East African uh, governments have been very quick to respond. Um, but there has been some, I would say, copycat response. And as always, what works in developing worlds, I think as through this conversation we're seeing, it doesn't necessarily work for countries that are far less underdeveloped. And we're struggling with a medical crisis in countries where they have no ventilators. But mm. quite quickly, they move on from a pneumonia pandemic is, or COVID-19 and as we've discussed into what is the trade uh, impacts here and those trade impacts are going to be far far greater than the deaths that we see from COVID-19. We know already there are a number of respiratory diseases most children under the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa are dying from respiratory diseases or through uh, acute uh, diarrhea that is continuing to to exist. We're seeing on in southern Africa 90 mile tailbacks at border crossings now and disinformation campaigns where people are being told that in Africa we're going to get the vaccine first because they want to test it on us and people turning away from borders because they think that's what's in, in store for them and I, I, I question the response that we're seeing in Africa is, is 
it, it, it isn't the right response. We, we know that. We know that we can't contain people. In refugee camps, we, we, it, where it, people are even more confined to their, their habitats, and uh, as we've touched on before, lack of water. So repurposing the NGOs has to be, be key, protecting NGOs at the same time. I was on the phone to Public Health England earlier in the week with some of the team that worked on the Ebola crisis, and they said distributing gloves and masks is not going to be the solution because if you don't use gloves and masks correctly and you're trying to train people which have uh, trouble with literacy, um, you're not going to get the effects. So do we send millions of dollars worth of PPE to, to Africa? And I'm not suggesting no one gets PPE where they need it, but reallocation of, of funds which is coming from the West needs to be much more uh, curated for the needs that we're seeing in developing countries. I've got several thousand people out of work today um, and I lobbied hard for the governments to understand that we could repurpose our factories. That's been done quickly. We're making oh, wait, 23 can, can million. What kind of business uh, it is? What kind of business uh, is it? So uh, I, I, I build and develop uh, ethical garment factories making for some of the world's biggest brands. Mm. And we've been able to retool and repurpose the factories to manufacturing PPE. In Kenya, we'll, we've, we're making, we'll be making over several million face masks a month. Um, yeah. But it, it took a long time to coordinate. I mean, at the beginning of this call, I think it was Robert Fox was talking about how where, where is the response to this? And I have factories which are supported by DFID. We do training. With, we, we have training programs in place with GIZ. I actually have factories in Ghana that manufacture PPE, which are supported by USAID and DFID. And it took me three weeks to explain to the British government we already manufacture this and ship it to the UK before they started considering placing orders. And at the same time, they were... There was focus on getting British companies to retool. And let me explain something really simple. Me, I'm just, Making a T-shirt, yeah. yeah, go, go for it. No, I'm just worried about time. No, just, no, just finish up. Talk about retooling here. You know, we've heard a lot about retooling and Burberry are going to retool and make face masks. You can't make face masks in a factory that makes jackets. It's not, it just doesn't work like that. You can't yeah. even make a polo shirt in a factory that makes T-shirts. It's different machinery. Yeah. So these are all... You know, we talk about that preparedness. Mm. Even the basics weren't prepared for. Well, Dominic, thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut, to cut you off. I do want to go back as we get towards the end. Um, the, a point that's been raised by uh, Dom Tyler, which I think really is important, and I'd like to put to James Cowan. Um, unless, Dom Tyler, you want to put it yourself. I don't know whether or not we can capture Dom uh, on screen. But he... Uh, uh, Dom, you've made this. You've made this point. Um, well, you you can make it about whether or not we're going to see an increase in in conflicts as a consequence of the pandemic. Yeah, sure. So, I know we, we've sort of jumped around a lot of different topics, but I think part of the the benefit of having someone like James on here is, you know, Halo deals with the aftermath or during conflict. Do you think um, that's going to increase due to particularly the economic um, effects of COVID nineteen? And yeah. what do you think we can do now, aside from defeating, you know, COVID-19, what can we do now to try and mitigate that, to try and decrease uh, the likelihood of, you know, real flare up in, in violence? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And I would point you to history. We all know, those of us who study history, that the, the causes of the Second World War don't necessarily lie in the First World War. They lie in the economic decisions made in the aftermath of the First World War. And conflict results when uh, nations turn in on themselves, look to their own national interest and fail to uh, adopt a, a multilateralist approach. This is the moment, I think, for our prime minister. In so many ways, he models himself on his hero, Churchill. And Churchill himself was ill uh, in the middle of the war. And of course, Churchill had his great moment in 1940 with the Battle of Britain. But actually, his success was not in being uh, the leader of the West, but in convening the West. Britain wasn't big enough. It convened an alliance that defeated Nazi Germany. And it seems to me there is an analogy here. Britain doesn't need to be the big player, but it can be a convener and it can set an example. And 20 million is a great start. And I think it's right that DFID have put all that money to those other supranational organizations, but it's only a start and so much more needs to be done. Um, James, thank you. Um, Ruth, I'm going to come, come to you now at the, at the end. I apologise because I realise that um, some people, Barney White, Spun and Jeremy Mortensen have got their hands up and we've not 
had a chance to hear from everybody. This is almost a way of things. But Ruth, if 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 you had that chance now to go and uh, whisper in the ear, hopefully, of a recovering Boris Johnson, what would be the things that you would say, right, these are the things that we need to do now to show that there is a UK leadership on the international stage? It's, you have to get the G20 together, you have to start um, making sure that you design what it is that you want to see, and you've got to recognise that absolutely you are you know, fighting on the battlefield in front of you, which is the COVID response in the United Kingdom, but that you do not protect the populace from second, third and tertiary waves without being able to project abroad. So you have to put us, you know, you have to apply troops to task. You have to put a significant amount of thinking power, of resource, of effort, of time, of money, government money, all of these resources into looking at being part of and potentially leading, convening, uh, and directing an international effort because that's the only way we get past this. Okay, Ruth, th thank you very much. Um, we we try to respect time, although in this weird world we're living in, time seems to blur. Uh, uh, you know, for for many of us. But we've come now to the to the end of the hour. If you've been to a thinking before, it really is intended to be like a news meeting. You're trying to come away saying, okay, what do I take away from that? I think I have to say I took away two really obvious things and should have thought about them more deeply. One is the very significant thing of let's use what we've got rather than trying to, you know, restructure the global architecture on the hoof. And the, the idea that in the way in which James presented, you could take an organisation which has the experience, given its mine, uh, experience working on mines, to trace, to work with communities and get them to pivot and pivot fast that seems like a really powerful idea and it some, sort of underlines the point that Ruth was making that if you are going to put 744 million pounds into the you know international efforts let's make sure a larger and larger sum goes to people who are actually going to be able to deliver prompt results on the ground. I am really struck and hadn't thought about it before by the point that Richard Sheriff made and of course that was backed up by James Cowan which is how could you use military capabilities to provide the infrastructure for all of that delivery uh, and that seems to me suddenly like a really urgent thing to think about uh, and it doesn't seem as though there's a coordination or the thinking about it yet or maybe I just haven't seen it but certainly that's something for us at Tortoise to look into. I do think there is something to be said for the if you like new approaches that were discussed. One was the the point that Ruth made at the top about horizon scanning, where's the unit that is actually going to do that and pull together not just people from within government, but people who are working, you know, whether it's in the business or the NGO world to really get a sense of what's happening globally. And I'm really struck by how do you marshal the, the international volunteer spirit that Robert Fox said. I think the most valuable thing about this and the thing that I think we as a, you know, uh, a small newsroom trying to understand what's driving the news rather than just breaking news, the small thing that we can do is keep paying attention to this. Because the thing that was most valuable for me about it was realising that this is not just a pandemic problem, this is potentially a famine problem, it's an impoverishment problem, it's a deep set of interconnected problems and so I hope that everyone who's joined us this evening will come back for future discussions of this. The risk with a pandemic, as was evidenced by so many people in the chat this evening, is that we don't look beyond uh, our own shores, we don't look at what's happening globally when we've got such a global problem on our hands. So I I'd just like to say a big thank you, particularly to James Cowan and to Ruth Davidson for really forcing us to look where we should be looking in the first place and to all of you for joining us. Um, if obviously you had all been in our newsroom in London we would have given Ruth and James a rousing um, uh, round of applause and probably taken them to the pub. We can now do neither of those things so we can merrily wave at each other um, and that's the way I think we should uh, call it to an end. Bye, <laughs> thank you very much indeed.